Hi, welcome to the Sojourner's Walk. In this tour, we hope that you can take a view of another side of Singapore. Sojourn, the word in English means to stay as a temporary resident, contributing, enriching, and when it's time, move on. Sojourn is another meaning, and that meaning is slightly negative. It means to be kept as a temporary resident. We will explore both in due course as we discuss the migration experience of a migrant worker. Here's a quote from Alice in Wonderland. When I use the word, Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I chose it to mean, neither more or less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many things. In the case of your tour today, what if we substitute the word word by including an alphabet and changing it to the word world? Can the world mean different things to different people, despite being a fixed geographic point? The Sojourner's Walk itinerary is designed for you to perhaps enter the looking glass to see these other parts of Singapore that you may not have seen because your social lenses is very different from the ones used to view Singapore through the Sojourners or the migrant workers population. The structure of this briefing basically is in the first part, I'll take you through some theory and look at reality and that hopefully will introduce you to the very different world that exists in this place called Singapore depending on whether you're a citizen or a more privileged member of society versus a migrant workers who are seen as unwanted immigrants someone who should be here temporarily work contribute and then sent home after the hopefully not too boring bits of lecture and briefing, we will start the actual tour. And here is the itinerary for your tour once this briefing has ended. The very first place you will visit is this place called Bangladeshi Square. It is this amazing little square off Deska Road that will be transformed every Sunday into one of the most crowded places you can ever be in within Singapore. After that, depending on your program, you, you have some tea and samosa at a Bangladeshi restaurant or some of you may have dinner. And depending on the order or planning by your guide, you may sometimes do grocery shopping with the migrants before your tea time or before your dinner. And an additional optional activity that we may have would be the cutting open of jackfruit and will end for us to codify your learning with a reflection and perhaps a call to action. Okay, so that's a program structure, briefing, tour, then reflection time. Step one, the Bangladeshi Square, or what locals call Bangla Square. That's the place that you'll be visiting. And the second stop will be the tiffin and conversation segment where you either have dinner or you have tea and in that section, you're encouraged to have conversations. So if you take a look at this, this is from a previous trip. Um, and if you look at it carefully, there's a little bit of problem with the geography of this occasion, because you'll find that the Bangladeshi or our migrant workers is in one side of the table where the tour participant is grouped among themselves and another side. I strongly encourage you to perhaps basically mingle or invite the foreign workers to sit amongst you so that while you are discussing about what you saw, you can have meaningful conversations with the migrant workers amongst you for them to explain what their off day is like, what their social life is like, and what are some of the things they do, or you can even have conversations about their hopes, dreams, and aspirations. Mingle, have conversation, learn, and perhaps you will see the humanity behind the label known as migrant workers. Stop three, and this sometimes could be stop two, so swap with the previous stop. You will visit 
a provision store within the vicinity of Bangladeshi Square to see what kind of grocery Bangladeshi foreign workers buy to bring back to their dorm in order to cook. Some of it may look familiar, some of it may not. It might be interesting for all of you to basically again have conversations and talk a little bit about day-to-day -day life. In order to help you make the most of your learning, the next step, I'll talk a little bit about how to navigate this through the living glass experience huh? where reality might be inverted, where the very Singapore you see looks very familiar and yet somehow very foreign. And the whole purpose of doing this tour is to try to enable you to grow your empathy by looking through the looking glass. And we hope you will learn from what you see. In navigating through a very different Singapore from the one that you may be used to or comfortable with, hopefully it will expose to you that there's always this constant contestation of spaces that exist beyond our sight. There is a Singapore we see as the more privileged community, and there is a Singapore that less privileged members of our community have to carve out in order to create a social space for themselves. In Singapore, there are many pockets of such spaces, such as Little India in Serangoon Road, where you'll be touring. There's also a Little Myanmar at Peninsula that is there because the Myanmar consulate is situated in that area. And there are little Philippines that first started out in Lucky Plaza and now, to a certain extent, occupy Topaya Central on Sundays where Filipino domestic helper congregate for their social gathering. And little Indonesia, where Indonesian domestic helper frequent in Gelang Serai or Juchet area. In being able to navigate through the looking glass experience, you must make your observation your teacher. The best way to frame your learning is to use something called reflection. Now, if you were to do it haphazardly, you might find it confusing and you may miss an important point. And so here I'm going to introduce a methodology that you may have encountered in your university life or in your education called the deal reflection structure. So here's a little bit of revision if you've ever come across it. If not, this is a very quick introduction. The deal structure and art of conversation, how to maximize your learning through reflection and hopefully that will help you also construct conversation with the migrant worker who's your tour guide today. How do you use reflection and what is the deal structure? Well, the word deal is an acronym and comprises of describe, examine, articulate learning. It provides a structure for us to review what we have learned in order to maximize our learning. So what is this structure? Let's go into it in slightly more detail now. The first word of the acronym deal is the word describe. In describing, you are trying to recall objectively your experience. So focus on the moments that surprise you or what I would call the what the heck moments. This would be information observations that are surprising to you, shocking, puzzling, frustrating, or illustrative of differences between you and the population you are trying to understand. In examine, you are trying to analyze using three lenses to understand the what the heck moments talked about earlier. And we do it through a personal lens, things that are intensely personal to us or from a personal point of view. And we'll look at a civic point of view from a social perspective or from a civic duty point of view. And finally, an academic perspective where we try to meld our learning to some of the theories or lessons that we may have learned back in the classroom. So these are the three lenses. Let's start off with personal. In this aspect, you want to make use of your personal feeling. For example, you want to focus on how did I feel seeing a Singapore redefined through our foreign workers view? How did my feelings change at the end? What are my stereotypes of foreign workers? And how have my assumptions changed at the end? Or how have my stereotypes been challenged or broken by this short, simple little walk? And more importantly, 
because we're dealing with a personal, we we'll want to look at your potential personal growth. How have I grown or benefited as a person because of this engagement or not? Reflect. The next lens that we can look at is to examine society. And here we can ask the simple question, have our society messed up? Maybe messed up is too harsh a word. Where have our society sort of stutter socially and how can we improve as a society? And here you want to make use of your observation of the role of a society and how this has been challenged as a result of this little walk. So here perhaps you might want to focus on your civic duty beyond your professional duty. Perhaps a question like this may help. How would I as a future professional benefit from such social awareness? Where are the gaps and weakness of our society in the treatment of foreign workers? What are some hidden contribution of our foreign workers that are hidden from our consciousness and why is it important for us to be aware of that? And perhaps more importantly, what can I as a future professional or an engaged citizen do to build a better society? And perhaps within here, an additional question, can we benefit as we strive to do good civic perspective? Huh? How the concept of a stronger society is a society with lesser weak links. And if we strengthen the weak link, how does society in general strengthen as well? So examine, we can do it from a civic perspective. The last lens in the examine section is something called academic. And here you can look at linking what you've seen today that may challenge some of the academic assumptions that you may have. So in this tour, has it enhanced the theories or knowledge from your classroom? If you study about prejudice and discrimination, do you see it in action? If you talk about economics, how, what have the things that you've seen in this section challenges the assumption that foreign workers only take money out and do not put money into Singapore's economy. And in doing so, you may have to dig deep within you and look at what kind of theories you may have find useful that may help you understand the challenges faced by the foreign workers. While learning in the classroom provides a safe environment, learning in a classroom is inherently artificial and because it's artificial, there will always be a lag between the theories that are discussed in the classroom and the reality out in the society. So the last point perhaps that you can look at is what are the gaps between learning in the classroom and real life and how do you maximize your learning by reducing or minimizing the gaps. And in doing so, perhaps, how do you drive your own learning? How do you maximize the efficiency of the theories that you acquire in the classroom in order for you to build a better society or become a more agile professional? The last part of the deal structure is something called articulate learning. And in this case, you're invited to apply your experience to strengthen your learning. How do you build on your experience? Here are some of the questions you can ask. What did I learn? How specifically did I learn it? You know, what aspect is of the tour? What aspect of the walk? And how does a short little walk of less than a kilometer trigger learning? And if it's useful, the next question becomes interesting. Why does this learning matter? Why is it important? And in what ways will I use this learning? What goal shall I set in accordance with what I've learned? in order to improve myself or the quality of my learning or the quality of my future. Whichever profession you're in, there will be use of what you've learned today, but the use can only come if you learn how to apply it. How will you apply it? In the next section, let's use a theory to scaffold your learning or rather for you to build a foundation from which you can do your observation. Since all of you are future professional in the medical care or healthcare sector, this theory is something that you may have encountered. It's called the biopsychosocial model of health. Let's take a refresh of this fairly powerful theory. Um, the concept is very simple. We tend to overemphasize on the biomedical factors. So this is things such as medical health, infectious diseases, or physical ailment. However, 
Our ability to get well or to attain biomedical health is linked to whether or not are we doing well in the sociological and psychological aspects of health. So for instance, in terms of sociological, we're looking at social integration, how well society is supporting us or how strongly they are blocking us from achieving our goals of being healthy. In psychological health, we're looking at psychological wellness, we're looking at mental health, we're looking at depression and all that, and how does not being psychologically healthy prevent us from prioritizing our biomedical health. So we're going to look at this three very simply before we set off on your little learning journey. First up, biomedical health. Everyone wants to be medically healthy. I mean, that is the intent of everyone. However, being able to be medically healthy means we must have access to the kind of health care that we are entitled to. Now, if you are a powerful member of society such as a citizen or a PR or an international student, you will find that in this aspect, we're kind of well taken care of living in a place like Singapore with one of the best healthcare systems in the world. However, this same access may not be true for someone who is not seen as a wanted citizen, such as the foreign workers holding a work permit visa, because they are meant to be a temporary resident. And their very work visa, work permit, is a form of immigration control as much as it is a work visa. Now, when you're not desired as a permanent resident or a permanent member of society, you do face a lot of difficulty and this will then create this thing called an impact on mental health or the psychological sphere. And this psychological sphere is also unattainable through excessive stress and this excessive stress then will cause the person who is under siege to prioritize anything other than medical health in order to get rid of the stress. And that is the concept of medical non-compliance. The lack of social health may also create barriers to accessing medical help. So for instance, we may have the best healthcare system in the world, but if the best healthcare system in the world is not entirely accessible to an individual, then in essence, it is all in name only could well have been the worst healthcare system in the world. And you'll find that being a work permit holder, there might be a lot of barriers against that. Next up, let's look at some challenges that may put the foreign workers more at risk of biomedical health. Here's some statistics from Manpower Ministries. And if you look at the extreme right column in the year 2023, the total injuries reported to Manpower Ministry is about 22,787. This possibly is less than the actual total because you will find that, and this is linked to sociological health, that the employers are worried that they might be fined or might be in the so-called black books of manpower ministry if there's too many workplace injuries and you may find that the employers may put strong pressure on the workers not to report any injuries if it's not too serious so you will find that sometimes serious injuries that doesn't present itself as serious injuries may not be reported until greater problems surface by then the worker may not be covered under the very insurance that is designed to help them so the concept that there is this thing called a sociological health in the form of social integration is briefly touched about just now in the discussion of the employer under sociological health the concept is this when we move to a new place, when we are living in a place where we're born, whichever, all of us want to be part of the community. We want to be socially integrated. However, if we ask outsiders looking in, or there are many rules that we perceive to be against us, you will find that there will be a lack of mental health. And this lack of mental health as a result of direct or indirect discrimination will then limit opportunities for social engagement. Either ways, it will have a knock-on impact on this thing called psychological health. And the lack of psychological health along with sociological health, which already provides barrier, now limit the access to engage the healthcare services. So sometimes if you're in the healthcare sector, you may find that 
patients are reluctant to complete the full course of treatment. You may find that patients sometimes may not be able to see you at the onset of injuries until much later on when the pain sets in or when they experience the inability to work or greater interruptions to their life. Sociological health. Next, let's look at some evidence that there is a lack of social acceptance of our foreign workers. In this case, while we will never accuse Singapore of being like South Africa and practicing apartheid, but do we have shades of social segregation? Let's look at this population density map. This is the Marine Parade constituency itself. Huh? The red part is Marine Parade GRC extends to quite a large area, but we're only looking at Marine Parade constituency, the one right by the southeastern part of Singapore. There are a total of 46,400 thereabout people living in Marine Parade constituency, and they are roughly distributed into about 58 blocks of HDB flats. Very congested. Singapore is one of the highest density in the world, but you can be sure that within individual household units in those 58 blocks of HDB flats, even the so-called poorest in Singapore will be entitled to fairly decent living space. If you look at your typical family structure, you're looking at maybe three to four per three room and above kind of housing units. So fairly good living and accommodation setting because compensate for our population density, we built upwards. Huh? So that's why we've got many units. However, what happens if you are a worker on a work permit visa, a temporary visa that allows you to work in a place like Singapore, you will find that the population density is experienced very differently. Huh? And here we're looking at giant mega dormitories such as the Sungai Tengah Lodge. There are a few of them around. In this particular dormitory settings, there are 10 blocks of 13-storey blocks. And the population, total population, is about 25,000. So roughly, slightly more than half of Marine Parade but squeezed into blocks of flats. And in each of these blocks of flat, you will find that they live in a dorm-like setting. So you are looking at typically about 12 to a room and up to COVID or even up to now, you will find that there are no ensuite toilets. So typically you see about perhaps up to about 50 to 100 people sharing a common toilet. COVID-19 changed all that because of the spread of COVID that spread very rapidly through the dormitory. Yeah? The post administrative reaction to this would be to recognize that there were some what lacking in terms of providing of essential rights or essential needs of the foreign workers. And so right now you're starting to find a lot of these blotch, they are now retrofitting their dormitory units to have toilets within individual rooms. So less contact between lots of people sharing a common toilet scenario. So sociological health. From this two, you can see that one is in a constituency, probably a mini suburban sort of setting. And the other one, half the size of the same population is squeezed into a small little estates not much different from the small section of Marine Parade Crescent, less than a square kilometer wide. Sociological health, inequality, and you must look at the lodge as a form of not just keeping people out like a condo, but perhaps the lodge are built to keep the people in, put them away from the residential area of Singapore so that the less likely chance of contact and put it far away from public transportation nodes so that there's less likely of foreign workers entering the society. So again, shades of social segregation, sociological health. Next up, psychological health. And here we're looking at things such as mental health. Again, like the other two spheres, everyone wants it. Our default position is we want good mental health. However, the lack of mental health creates a lot of pain and emotional stress and the stress meant that we will have to prioritize the combating of that stress over everything else and so therefore the lack of 
mental health will lead to deprioritization of medical health. I mean, if you look at point two, the lack of medical health may prolong an injury, prolong the pain, reduce access to pain management, and that then leads to an inability to work or perform one's job optimally, and therefore there will be great emotional stress because you've got to know that the foreign worker's ability to earn a living is linked to their ability to work and more importantly for them to be able to renew their contract because quite often from the second contract onwards do they then start to earn enough money to make their trip to Singapore worthwhile. The lack of social health will, as discussed in the earlier slides, create discriminatory barriers and this in turn will affect mental health. So you can see that in order to have good mental health, the foreign workers' inability to access medical health and their lack of social integration will create impact on their mental health, limiting their ability to have a good mental health state. This point is taken from the excellent health awareness site, Health Hub, put out by Health Ministry in Singapore. And here is Health Hub's discussion on the external contributors to stress. Our mental health is impacted by things such as personal problems, work problems, relationship problems, financial crisis, health problems, unemployment, losses, bereavement, unexpected news, or daily hassles. Now, these are the more common thing. Let's look at each of these and see how the foreign workers and what they face in their daily life creates threats to their mental health. Personal problem. Imagine that you live in a multi-person dormitory and in most cases, typically 12 person, you've got 11 other roommates and they come from different culture, they may a different state of the work permit window, they may have different employers or work on different jobs so therefore your ability to create a social network might be challenged which means that you're living with people whom should be close to you but in effect might be strangers for a greater part of your two years stay here personal problems so that will impact on the mental health work problems now you'll find that the actual work done by foreign workers often is physically very tiring and often they are at the lowest of the power totem pole which then meant that there might be a lot of things in their work that is beyond their control. Relationship issues, here it's kind of linked to what we talked about above. There might be issues that the foreign worker has working with their employers who are more seeing them as economic units designed to work, designed for them to produce and ignoring the more human side of things such as fatigue, such as tiredness, such as a need to rest. So relationship issues with their bosses and we discuss in the personal problems area the relationship issues linked to roommates etc etc. The foreign workers in order to come to Singapore quite often have to incur great financial debt in order to come and so typically they will experience debt of anywhere between five to ten thousand dollars in order to secure a job here which de facto meant that if they don't work they don't get paid if they don't get paid coming to Singapore makes it worse than if they have not come at all that first year of the first work permit contract is extremely stressful primarily because of this thing called a financial debt due to the recruitment fee if you look at the next point, health problems, right at the bottom of the left, the statistics you saw from the biomedical health in the previous section, well, the health problems essentially will always be there, primarily because a lot of the foreign workers are working in jobs that expose them to great risk. They are outdoor jobs, they are physically challenging jobs, there are high instances of injuries as evident from the statistics of about 22,000 reported injuries in 2023. So the exposure to health problems is going to be very real and if you couple this with the unbalanced power relationship issues with their employer, 
along with the threat of financial disaster leading them to being unable to negotiate with their employers when they are ill, you now have a compounded health problems issue. And a lot of this is then linked to what we see on the right side, something called unemployment, or rather in the case of foreign workers, it's the constant fear of unemployment because unemployment for the foreign workers case meant the withdrawal of the work permit visa. So the fear of unemployment creates a great impact on mental health. And you'll find that this fear of unemployment is then now linked to the refusal to seek medical help because it might be perceived by the foreign worker that if they have too many days MC, they might be ranked or rated differently. And when it comes to contract renewal at the end of the two year work permit visa, their employers may not renew their contract. Let's take losses and bereavement and unexpected news in the middle two of the right together. And let's use one of the countries that is represented by a lot of foreign workers in our land, eh? Bangladesh. In the year 2024, Bangladesh went through quite a lot of political upheaval. The government, um, judged to be corrupt by its citizens, were under a lot of siege and initially they reacted in a very draconian manner towards those public dissent. There were a lot of very harsh treatment of mass protesters and demonstrators, young people in universities who were protesting, essentially some of them were killed. Now imagine if you're a foreign worker and you're in Singapore, you're looking at this political turmoil, this is unexpected news because the country is supposed to be stable and suddenly you're getting news that this instability is not just hurting the country you left behind, but it is also potentially inflicting deaths and injury on its citizen and some of whom may be the relatives of the foreign workers. Being stuck here meant that the foreign workers have no control. They're far away. They would like to be back to tend to bad things that happen to their loved ones, but they have no access. If you look at unexpected news, we can also look at how global warming has resulted in the raising of the storm threats. And so you look at Myanmar, you look at Philippines, it's been buffeted by numerous powerful typhoons, monsoon rains, and that sometimes have led to losses and bereavement through flooding and landslides. All this news, when it is experienced or touched the foreign workers who are stuck in Singapore on a two-year visa contract, can have a huge impact on their mental health. Under daily hassles, the last column, in your little walk with the foreign worker tour guide as you navigate Little India, don't just focus on what you see in Little India, use this as an opportunity to find out a little bit more what the day in the life of a foreign worker is like. What are some of the daily hassles? Some of us may have seen it, even though it doesn't exist in our consciousness. How many of us here have noticed to this day, quite a lot of foreign workers are still being ferried at the back of lorries. For citizens, that seems rather odd, isn't it? Lorries and trucks are for goods, not for human beings. And yet, one of the transport to transport foreign workers on work permit is on the back of lorries. Daily hassles, huh? All of us have access to a reasonable form of public transport and others are prevented from using public transport because there's greater efficiency to move them from where they live to where they work and move them from where they work back to where they live, limiting contact with the greater society. Daily hassles. Ask them about their average work day. What time do they wake up? What time do they get to the place of work? How long do they work? What time do they get back to the dormitory? What must they do prior to being able to sleep? What time do they go to the bed? And if you go through all that, and you will find that some studies have highlighted that foreign workers typically have roughly around five and a half hours of sleep, you start to see that the daily life of the foreign workers may constitute a threat to psychological health. I hope it's not been too boring. To sum up, what have we learned so far? 
what we see as perfect health is not necessarily the perfect state that is easily attainable. We can provide good medical care and so if you're medical students, eventually you will become excellent doctors who will give good medical advice but your medical advice may not necessarily be adhered to by your patient because they might be suffering challenges to mental wellness and sociological inclusivity and therefore deprioritize their medical wellness. So while your advice, while appreciated, may not necessarily be followed to the T because something else is preventing them from being followed. Let me bring you back to the Venn diagrams of three interlocking circles again. In the biopsychosocial model, if I'm down on sociological and psychological health, you will find that my medical health is being affected as well because they're interlocking. My inability to access wellness in one or two other circles will indirectly affect my ability to have good medical health. And a key learning point here is this. In your future, when you encounter medically non-compliant individuals, one of the key thing or first thing we must do is to suspend judgment, to inquire, to look further, and in doing so, we can perhaps understand better. Little tours such as this, activities such as this, invites you to see things from the foreign worker's point of view, because that's exactly what we hope you will acquire and you will build as you grow into the professional you will become, that you acquire this thing called empathy. Empathy is a very, very useful tool that will complement your medical and nursing skills. Let's talk a little bit about this thing called stress, okay? Because it's the key threat to our ability to attain health. We've talked a little bit about stress, but stress really is not wholly evil. Huh? We need stress to motivate us. So if you look at the blue and red section of the bell curve, blue section, too little stress, a condition known as underload, there is no motivation to act. Huh? So like for instance, if I am your anatomy lecturer, I say that, okay, it doesn't matter what essay you write, whether you write 1,000 word essay or a 100 word essay, you're guaranteed of an A+. In this case, no impact on your stress at all. Some of you may find that liberating and you learn a lot. Good. A lot may say, well, let's focus on the other subjects that we will fail first. So your performance in this particular scenario will be fairly low because there's nothing that push you to perform. So that is why sometimes, although your teachers may hate it, you'll find that grading is a necessary evil because you are trying to use the concept of potential failure to help trigger stress that will motivate you to do your revision and put more interest into your homework. Let's look at the right side of the bell curve. Huh? If there are too much stress at the extreme scenario in the burnout stage indicated by the red, you'll find that at that stage, I'm no longer focused on the learning. I'm no longer focusing on doing well. And in that particular state, I am past the exhaustion point and I am just simply studying without learning. And when we look at from the point of view of medical motivation, you will find that too much stress and the burnout stage is where what we call medical non-compliance occur. Now, if you look at our previous discussion on the challenges faced by the foreign workers, you can see that there are many things there that will cause them to deprioritize their medical wellness or even cause them to ignore physiological injuries caused by workplace accident because they are more concerned about their financial problems, they are more concerned about things that are happening back home, they are more concerned about the lack of rest, the lack of ability to integrate, and all this may then push them towards a deprioritization of medical wellness on their part, stress levels. A little bit for you to understand and so in your little tour have that little conversation 
see if their life of the foreign workers is the same as yours and if it's not how different is it from yours here's a little bit more about the Salvation Army Sojourn program and what we do the Sojourn program is a Salvation Army mission and it essentially support the foreign workers on issues faced by them and the key needs or key points of interest is to serve the foreign workers through services such as rehabilitation, counselling and dorm engagement. It also looks actively into workers' health, safety and well-being through collaborations with tertiary institutions and professionals who kindly donated their time. And what it tries to do is to establish communities of care and inclusion. And in doing so, it also does outreach to promote cultural awareness and raise empathy for foreign workers, for corporates and schools through tours like the one you will be embarking on, visits to migrants living in the dormitories and culture exchange programs such as the picture you see here, where such programs promote interactions between migrant workers and the community in order to reduce the barriers between both communities. Next, a little plea for help. We are a charity and charity has limited resources and our existence and our ability to do good work is linked to the kind generosity of the community from within we operate. This is purely optional. If you can, and would like to please support our ability to do more for our migrant workers through a kind donation, however large or small. Here are the instructions on how to do so. Thank you very much. Wishing you a fruitful learning journey as you navigate Little India and seeing it through the sojourner's eyes. This is a presentation brought to you by the School of Health Sciences Neon Polytechnic in collaboration with the Salvation Army Sojourn Program.